And thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. Happy to have you with us. Big thanks to Ali Velshi for filling in for me yesterday while I was fishing. I did okay. I was out with my friend who always catches more fish than me. I caught two fish before she caught anything, and then she caught one, but it was way smaller. <sighs> it's a really nice day. Anyway, but it's also nice to be back at work, and yes, I put the fish back. All right, um, if we're going to start anywhere tonight, uh, the poop train seems like as good a place as any to start. Last year, train cars filled with human sewage started turning up unwanted in Alabama towns. Now, uh, this was not human sewage of an Alabama origin, which would be bad enough, right? Somehow it was worse that this was imported human sewage. This is human sewage that was uh, generated, is the right word? Uh, generated in the first instance by humans in New York and New Jersey, and then got shipped on a train down to Alabama. Uh, now this sewage was treated, and on paper, theoretically, it was supposed to be a totally inoffensive thing to ship by rail and park in your town. Uh, but that turned out to be a load of, uh, let's call it claptrap. This stuff stunk so bad as it passed through town after town after town in Alabama, that town after town after town and county after county, every place it turned up, the locals realized, whoa, we have no choice. We have to fight back. We need to get this stuff out of here. We need to do something to keep this stuff away. Uh, at one point early last year, the poop train ended up parking in a town called West Jefferson, Alabama, and it parked way out at an out-of-the-way small rail yard. Um, I think they thought that was going to be uh, sort of out of sight, out of mind. It was not out of stink range. That rail yard was not enough out of the way, given how bad this stuff smelled. The town of West Jefferson, Alabama revolted, literally. A judge ultimately allowed the town to kick the poop train out of that distant rail yard as a zoning violation, because the people in that town literally could not stomach it. That same train then moved on to a town called Parrish, Alabama. Uh, before the poop train arrived in Parrish, the town mayor had expressed confidence that this would be no problem. She told the local press she didn't have any objections. She didn't think the train passing through her town or loading or unloading at the rail yard in her town would pose any particular problem. But oh man, that was just in theory. When the train actually showed up full of human sewage, that same mayor of Parrish, Alabama, her name's Heather Hall, she told AL.com, she told AL .com, quote, the smell really started getting bad here. I mean, it was terrible. Quote, it greatly reduces the quality of life of anybody that this is around. You cannot go outside. You cannot sit on your porch. And, and this stuff, it's here in our town. It's not like it's an industrial area. She told the paper, quote, we were hoping things wouldn't be like they were in West Jefferson, that maybe the reactions in West Jefferson were overblown, but we came to realize real quick like that they were not blowing it out of the water. This stuff does not need to be in a populated area, period. And so Parrish, Alabama had thought it would be fine. It was not fine. And the poop train got moved out of West Jefferson. Then it got moved out of Parrish. People, people in Parrish had thought those West Jefferson people complaining were big wusses, just making a big deal out of nothing. They quickly were disabused of that notion. And so the, the poop train was moved out of Parrish, Alabama as well. Where did they move it to? They moved it to Birmingham, Alabama, uh, which you have heard of because Birmingham is a big place in Alabama. Uh, and when the poop train moved into town there, the reaction was instant and soon became national. Uh, a councilman for the area in Birmingham where the train had stopped turned up at the next Birmingham City Council meeting to raise the alarm about railroad cars in his area of the city, quote, that may be carrying feces from other states, quote, when they get stopped on the train tracks in your area, the stench is almost unbearable. In the local press uh, and in local social media, the reaction was even stronger. Some local businesses reportedly starting, started getting calls that there must be a dead body nearby somewhere because nothing else could possibly explain a smell that awful. Eventually, Alabama's poop train troubles uh, made national news all over the country this past spring. And a lot of that coverage came from the explicit or implicit angle that somehow New Jersey and New York 
had done something wrong here, right? New Jersey and New York had foisted this train full of you know, Yankee poop on Alabama without Alabama having any say in the matter or having any idea that it was coming. The problem for that angle and the national coverage of this strange story from earlier this year, the problem for that angle was that the state of Alabama's Department of Environmental Management, the state environmental agency in Alabama, had actually approved this whole plan. They'd approved this whole idea. Apparently, they didn't look into it at all that much detail uh, when they agreed that Alabama would receive you know, like 10 million pounds of this stuff indefinitely on an ongoing basis from the Northeast. They just decided, oh, we'll just tuck it into a landfill somewhere. Nobody will mind. The state environmental authorities in Alabama are not known for their stellar modern track record. Uh, the previous administrator of the state's environmental agency had been embarrassed and ultimately forced out of office after what seemed like a never-ending series of ethics scandals, including accepting baseball tickets and uh, other gifts from a company that his agency regulated. He accepted private plane trips for his whole family to Disney World. Uh, from another company who had business before the state, he also, as a state official, had approved payments to a company that was run by a guy that he was applying for a job with. The Alabama State Ethics Commission unanimously referred him for criminal prosecution on that one. And that really means something in Alabama. I mean, Alabama has been really kind of busy recently on ethics issues. Just within the past few years, Alabama's Speaker of the House, the serving Speaker of the House, was convicted on multiple felonies and sentenced to multiple years in prison. That happened at roughly the same time that the state's governor was forced from office in a sex and ethics scandal. And that happened around the same time that the state's chief Supreme Court judge was kicked off the bench in an ethics scandal. You might remember him, actually. His name is Roy Moore. He went on to be the Republican Party's nominee for the U.S. Senate seat that opened up when Jeff Sessions moved from the U.S. Senate over to the Justice Department to become the Trump administration's first attorney general. Roy Moore's Senate campaign was the point at which pedophilia and its public defense became part of the Trump era of Republican politics. It's also how we got a Democrat in the United States Senate from the great state of Alabama. And Alabama decided they couldn't stomach Roy Moore in that capacity. Alabama has had a busy few years in general on ethics issues, but on environmental stuff, Alabama has been even worse than that. I mean, it has been a poop train couple of years in Alabama. Uh, that same administrator of the state's environmental agency, the one who got referred for prosecution, the one who left office under this cloud of mushrooming ethics controversies, after he left office as the top environmental official in the state, he uh, left to go work in his private business career. In his private business career, he became a key player in the worst criminal environmental scandal to hit that state in years. I mean, even after losing the top person in the legislature, the top person in the Supreme Court, and the governor to ethics scandals almost simultaneously, the state of Alabama has since subsequently had to endure a huge criminal bribery and money laundering scandal involving top businesses and law firms in the state who were trying to stop the EPA cleanup of a radically polluted, densely populated black neighborhood in North Birmingham. That scandal is ongoing. It has resulted in multiple lengthy prison sentences. It has even ensnared Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Remember, he's from Alabama. As a senator, turns out he got lots of money from the people behind that scheme. As a senator, turns out he lobbied against that EPA cleanup effort, which is apparently what they were paying people for. Jeff Sessions even turned up on the witness list in a recent felony trial that sent a well-known business executive and a top Alabama Republican lawyer to prison in that environmental scandal. I should also mention that once Jeff Sessions stopped being a senator implicated in that scandal and started being Attorney General of the United States, he never once said he was recused from overseeing that matter as a federal prosecution despite his personal and direct involvement in it. But when it came time to staff up the Trump administration, they didn't just go to Alabama for an attorney general. The Trump administration also went to Alabama for environmental expertise. That guy from the state environmental agency in Alabama, the guy who was referred for criminal prosecution, the one who got in trouble for accepting all those gifts and private plane rides from his family, from companies he was supposed to be overseeing, the one who left state office in a cloud of scandal and then got involved in what turned out to be a giant criminal scheme to keep a poor black neighborhood polluted and not cleaned up. 
That is who President Trump named to run the Environmental Protection Agency for the whole southeastern United States. Was anybody else on the short list? Um, his name is Trey Glenn. President Trump appointed him to run the biggest region in the country for the EPA. It covers eight states in the southeast. Uh, John Archibald, the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist at AL.com, uh, wrote a column at the time when Trey Glenn was appointed um, in which he, John Archibald, basically could not contain himself. He wrote, quote, ha ha, exclamation point. That guy now heads the Environmental Protection Agency? It's like Roy Moore leading the ACLU. But then it got better. Uh, after Trump appointed that guy to run the EPA for the whole quarter of the country, right, for the whole southeastern United States, that guy, now as a high-ranking federal employee, eventually had to make public financial disclosures. Well, when his public financial disclosures came out a few months ago, Alabama learned for the first time that among the folks who had been paying him since he left his job running the state environmental agency before he got appointed by Trump to run the EPA for the whole southeastern United States, among the people who put him on the payroll were the poop train folks. Yeah, literally the landfill company that brought the poop train into all of those towns in Alabama, they had this guy on their payroll as the former top environmental official in the state. Uh, here's John Archibald again, quote, Trey Glenn, the Trump-appointed EPA director, has more ties to that poop train and its dumping ground than the railroad track it ran on. Quote, all the Charmin in the world cannot wipe it away. Quote, ain't enough scrubbing bubbles in the world to clean the stain. Uh, as of tonight, Trey Glenn still serves in the Trump administration as the head of the EPA for the whole southeastern United States. It's hard to believe that will stay the case, however, because today Trey Glenn was indicted for multiple state crimes related to his time so ably administering environmental issues in his home state of Alabama. Uh, we've been, I got to tell you, we've been trying to get a hold of the charging documents from his indictment in Alabama today. It's been a little tricky to get a hold of them, but it appears that he has been basically charged with corruption charges, essentially akin to uh, bribery and, and conspiracy. So the administrator, the head of the largest region in the country for the EPA, is now under criminal indictment in Alabama. This comes, of course, after the head of the whole EPA for the Trump administration, Scott Pruitt, was forced out of office, forced out of the Trump cabinet in his own maelstrom of ethics scandals. Uh, we actually learned after Scott Pruitt was forced out as the head of the EPA under Trump that at least one of the scandals that forced him out of office also resulted in a referral of Scott Pruitt to the U.S. Justice Department for criminal prosecution. We learned that after he was already gone. We learned that around the same time that we learned that another Trump cabinet official, the current Secretary of the Interior, Ryan Zinke, has also been referred to the U.S. Justice Department for potential criminal prosecution. All right, so, so given the, the Alabama background of the Trump administration environmental official who was indicted today, it's easy to see that maybe as an Alabama scandal, right? I mean, there's been a lot of Alabama ethics scandals. There's been a lot of Alabama ethics scandals related to the environment, and, right? Maybe it's an Alabama thing. I will mention that it's a little bit weird to see a state court indicting a high-ranking federal official rather than these corruption charges being brought as federal charges. Kind of makes you wonder if maybe the stench of this Alabama case sort of followed Jeff Sessions all the way into the U.S. Federal Justice Department in one way or another. How come the feds aren't on this if this is a high-level public corruption case? involving a federal official. But the latest indictment of someone serving in a high level in the Trump administration at this point, whatever the fine points are of his alleged crimes and his culpability, at this point you also have to see it as just the latest tilt in a White House and an administration that appears to be going quite wobbly at the moment. I mean, ever since we learned, for example, that Ryan Zinke has been referred to the Justice Department for criminal prosecution, there's been an open question as to how he can still be in the cabinet, right? Serious questions about how long he can stay in the job when he's under federal criminal investigation. When will he become the next Trump administration cabinet official to resign in an ethics scandal and under the threat of federal corruption prosecution? The last couple of days have also been filled with news stories suggesting that Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen might be about to be fired. 
The president today canceled what was supposed to be a trip to the southern U.S. border with Secretary Nielsen. Maybe that's because he's going to fire her. Maybe it's because he was afraid it might rain. I don't know. But the White House is sort of gleefully stoking the idea that another cabinet secretary is about to be fired. There have also been a new round of reports, including tonight, that the president is on the verge of firing his second White House chief of staff, John Kelly, which may or may not be true. Who knows? Right? But, that's, but there's more, right? In the middle of the afternoon today, there was even a brief flurry of weird stories that the first lady of the United States, the president's wife, had somehow arranged the firing of the deputy national security advisor. And I know, <laughs> I know that sounds crazy. I mean, yes, first ladies in the past have clashed with White House staffers up to and including famously the White House chief of staff under President Reagan, who was disfavored by and ultimately axed to please first lady Nancy Reagan. I get it, like White House staff and the first lady sometimes clash. But a national security job? Melania Trump wants to fire the deputy national security advisor? Is that how we do things? Nobody knows if that's how we do things. I mean, there were these initial reports today, first in the Wall Street Journal, that the deputy national security advisor of the United States, Mira Ricardo, had been frog marched out of the White House and had her pass revoked at the insistence of the first lady. Those reports later turned out to be inaccurate when other people reliably produced information that, in fact, the deputy national security advisor was still inside the White House. None of that conflicting reporting, though, could erase this actual statement, which really was put out by the office of the first lady today. Quote, it is the position of the office of the first lady that she, Mira Ricardo, deputy national security advisor, no longer deserves the honor of serving in this White House. It is the position of the Office of the First Lady. Apparently tonight, the Deputy National Security Advisor still enjoys the honor of serving in this White House, but now everywhere she goes, it's under an imaginary banner that floats over her head right, that says, the First Lady wants me fired. Can I still stay? The White House uh, the Trump administration, more broadly, appears to be in a kind of rattly phase. Uh, they appear to be in an even more chaotic state than usual. There have been ethics troubles in this administration from the very beginning. Some of today's wobbles appear to be the inevitable product of law enforcement and investigatory pressure on ethically challenged high-ranking individuals, including those who are now facing either criminal investigation or flat-out indictment in the case of this EPA official. So some of it, I think, is driven by the way ethics scandals tend to end up, which is not good for the ethically challenged official. A lot of this, though, appears to be driven by the political pressure that the White House is newly under in the wake of last week's elections results. Tonight marks one week since the polls closed in the midterms. The scale of the Democratic Party's victory in last week's election is still coming into focus one week later as vote tallies get certified and close elections get called and recounts get fought over. The turnout in this year's midterm elections appears to have been the highest midterm election turnout in more than a century. The percentage of the popular vote by which Democrats won congressional seats around the country appears to be even higher than the popular vote percentage that gave Republicans their massive landslide win in 2010, which President Obama famously called a shellacking. Democrats did better in terms of the popular vote this year in 2018 than Republicans did in the shellacking year of 2010. Democrats appear on track to gain 37, if not 38, seats in the House of Representatives in these elections, which would be their largest congressional gains in a midterm election since the immediate aftermath of Watergate, right after Richard Nixon resigned. In the Georgia governor's race and in the Florida governor and Senate races, what appeared on election night to be Republican wins, those are now turning into full-blown ballot-to-ballot battles in both states, including in the courts, or today, the big development was a federal court judge ordering the delay of the certification of the vote to totals in Georgia, which is what the Stacey Abrams campaign has been fighting for because they say not every vote has been counted and what they want is for every vote to be counted. So there's a lot going on right now um, in the news. There's a lot of pressure on this White House and this administration. And from everything we have seen thus far, this is a president who does not handle pressure particularly well. To the extent that his political fortunes and his legal jeopardy are tied up into one great double helix of a story right now, the president's firing of Jeff Sessions in the immediate aftermath 
of last week's elections. His effort to put, a federal law put in charge of federal law enforcement in the entire U.S. Justice Department, uh, a, a, a random loyalist who was never approved by the Senate, I think ultimately this may be seen, when we look back on it someday, as the president's big Hail Mary pass at this point in his term in office. His one big, desperate, probably won't work effort to try to fix all of his problems all at once by trying to fix law enforcement so that it starts to help him out instead of continuing to threaten both him and senior members of his administration. Hail Mary passes occasionally do work, right? That's why it's still a play that people try in football. Um, there are reasons, though, tonight to think that this one is probably not going to work. And we've got that story for you next. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.